Well, at this time, we'll dismiss our young folks to their worship time. They're going to go learn about Jesus and have fun. I want to invite you to open your Bible, if you would, this morning to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is one of my favorite books in all the Old Testament. It's called by many the Gospel of the Old Testament. When you read through the book of Isaiah, it's all about Jesus. Today's message I've entitled, A Fresh Encounter with God. Uh, we're going to read together from the Word of God, beginning in verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, now seraphim are angels. Each one had six wings with two. He covered his face with two, he covered his feet. With two he flew. I've read that some believe that two wings that covered the face and the feet were worship or indicated worship and the two wings that flew indicated service. And that's really a picture of what we're to be about, isn't it? Worship and serve. Our service, it flows out of our worship. And now look at verse three. And one cried to another, and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us. Who is the us? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, clearly. But then I said, this is the voice of Elijah, or Isaiah, excuse me. Then I said, Isaiah said, here am I, send me. May God add his blessing to our reading of his word this morning. Isaiah, the name Isaiah means Jehovah saved. And Isaiah, I believe, stands as one of the greatest of the prophets of God. Through days of crisis, through days of disaster, Isaiah constantly called his nation back to faith in the living God. Now, something that I learned in my study just this week, I learn every day as I study, as I read the scriptures, but I learned that Isaiah was of royal blood he was a part of the royal family. Isaiah's father's name was Amos. We know that from the Bible. Now, according to the Jewish Talmud, Amos was a brother of King Amaziah. Amaziah, King Amaziah, was King Uzziah's father. And so this would make the prophet Isaiah and King Uzziah cousins. This chapter that we read together this morning begins with the announcement of the death of King Uzziah. Now I want to say this, when you study the history of the people of God, outside of King David and outside of King Solomon, King Uzziah was probably the most influential king in the history of the Jewish people up to that time. King Uzziah started to rule when he was a teenager. He was 16 years old when he became king. Do we have any 16-year-olds here this morning? How many of you would like to have a 16-year-old king? That's a remarkable thing, isn't it? He would rule for 52 years. 
Now I want you to listen to what the Bible records about his rule. Listen to these words. You'll find them in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. All of the people of Judah had crowned Amaziah, 16-year-old son Uzziah, as king in place of his father. After his father's death, Uzziah rebuilt the town of Elath and restored it to Judah. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 52 years. His mother was Jechaliah from Jerusalem. Now notice what verse 4 says. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, just as his father Amaziah had done. Uzziah sought God during the days of Zechariah, and that would be Zechariah the prophet of Scripture, who taught him to fear God. And as long as the king sought guidance from the Lord, God gave him success. Those are good words. Uzziah began well and ruled well for a long time. Under Uzziah's leadership, the nation had been blessed by the Lord God. The people of Israel had prospered on their farms and in their businesses. King Uzziah implemented a number of construction projects and public works. Almost everyone in the kingdom had a job that wanted one. The national defense of the nation was strengthened by beefing up the military. Everything was going great in Israel under King Uzziah's leadership. The blessing of the Lord was upon the king and upon the people. But something happened. That prosperity, it eventually led to pride on the part of the king and on the part of the people. And the Bible gives us a sad account in 2 Chronicles chapter 26 and verse 16. It says about Uzziah when he had become powerful, he also became proud, which led to his downfall. He sinned against the Lord his God by entering the sanctuary of the Lord's temple and personally burning incense on the incense altar. Azariah, the high priest, went in after him with 80 other priests of the Lord, all of them brave men. They confronted King Uzziah and said, it is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord. This is the work of the priest alone, the descendants of Aaron who were set apart for this work. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have sinned, and the Lord your God will not honor you for this. Uzziah, who was holding an incense burner, became furious, but as he was standing there raging at the priest before the incense altar in the Lord's temple. Leprosy suddenly broke out on his forehead. And when Azariah the high priest and all the other priests saw the le leprosy, they rushed him out. And the king himself was eager to get out because the Lord had struck him. So King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in isolation in a separate house for he was excluded from the temple of the Lord. He began well, King Uzziah, but he did not finish well. And when King Uzziah died, the nation began to go into what I would call a death spiral. They neglected the commandments of God. They neglected the worship of God. And the peace and the prosperity that they had enjoyed for so long, it, it began to flee like roaches when the lights are turned on. The greed, the lies, the sinful lifestyles, the drunkenness, the arrogance, the injustice of the people was coming home to roost. Things would get so bad that you read in the first few chapters of Isaiah. Isaiah said the people started calling that which was evil as good and that which was righteous and good as something that was evil. You read the first five chapters of the book of Isaiah and it reminds me of the conditions in America today. 
for Isaiah and the entire nation. King Uzziah's death ushered in a time of uncertainty and change and doubt. Now the news of King Uzziah's death reached this young prophet, Isaiah. And in an agony of grief and sorrow, he entered the courts of the temple in order that he might seek after the Lord. You know what? Isaiah needed a fresh vision of the Lord. He needed a fresh encounter with God. And I believe the same thing can be said for all of us here today as God's people. Now, there's three things I want you to see in the message this morning. A simple message. The first point I want you to get is we need to see what Isaiah saw. Isaiah went to the Lord's temple one day and he saw the one thing everybody ought to see when they go to the Lord's house. What was it? Look down in verse 5. What does it say? For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I want you to know this morning, when you come to the Lord's house, you come to seek the Lord. Isaiah saw the living God as very few persons in the Old Testament saw him. I believe that Isaiah saw the pre-incarnate Christ. The Lord Jesus would quote from the prophet Isaiah in his teaching in the Gospel of John, the 12th chapter. And note what the Lord Jesus said in referring to this. He said in John chapter 12 and verse 41, Isaiah was referring to Jesus when he said this. Because he saw the future and he spoke of the Messiah's glory. Isaiah the prophet experienced a fresh vision of God. And Isaiah was allowed to share with us in the word of God through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit this wonderful story. Now let me say this this morning to you. More than anything else in this world, this nation, the United States of America, needs a fresh vision of God. This church needs a fresh vision of God. You and I need a fresh vision of God. For you see, once you see the King of Kings, once you see the Lord of Lords, the living God in all of His glory, you will not ever be the same again. We need to see what Isaiah saw. Look what happened to Isaiah as a result of this vision. Isaiah recognized God's position. Now, I want you to see there are two kings in view in verse 1. One of them is a dead king, Uzziah. One is a divine king. One is a mortal king. One is an immortal king. One is an earthly king. One is a heavenly king. One king had died, as all earthly kings do. One king lives forever as no earthly king can. King Uzziah died. Isaiah saw the Lord. I want to remind you of what the Bible tells us in Lamentations chapter 5 and verse 19. You, O Lord, remain forever. You're thrown from generation to generation. Now, I want you to notice this morning very carefully with me what the Lord is not doing. Do you see the Lord pacing back and forth, wringing his hands, wondering what he's going to do because Uzziah has died? No. When Isaiah saw the Lord, he saw the Lord high and lifted up. And what was he doing? He was sitting on a throne. Isaiah saw clearly what we need to see completely in these troubled days in which we live. And that is simply this. God is on the throne. And God is in complete control. Now I see the newspaper headlines. I read about the interest rates and the devastating wars and the debilitating diseases 
and the destructive crime in our world. We're living in a troubled time, and it's as troubled as I've ever seen it in 63 years of life. But I have good news for you this morning. The Lord is on the throne. Now, when you see the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, what does that mean? It means that you are seeing a sovereign God, a God who's in control, a God who's in charge, a God who has all authority. The earthly king, Uzziah, may have died, but the Lord God Almighty still reigns. And Isaiah saw the Lord in all his glory. And it had a profound impact upon Isaiah's life. Let me say this to you. In, in these days of darkness and difficulty, and doubt and despair, you need to understand this morning one thing. God is on the throne, and everything is under control. For the child of God today, doubt ought to be out. Faith ought to be in. There's many things I don't know, but one thing I do know. The Lord God rules, and he reigns. Him writer wrote it like this, have faith in God. He's on his throne, have faith in God. He watches o'er his own. He cannot fail, he must prevail. Have faith in God, have faith in God. Isaiah recognized God's position, his sovereignty, his authority. But then if you look at verses two and three, Isaiah recognized God's purity. Above him stood the seraphim. We read about them in verse two. We talked about them earlier. Notice verse three, one cried to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. More than anything else this morning that you understand about God, you must understand this today. Our God is a holy God. He is not the man upstairs. He is not some nameless creator that we cannot know. He is not some absentee landlord who has no interest in the affairs of this world. He is the thrice holy God of Israel. And he loves godliness and he hates wickedness. And he will one day judge this world in righteousness. Now understand this morning, holiness is not something that God has. Holiness, holiness is not something that God does. Holiness is something that God is. And God's holiness is a unique holiness. Listen to 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 2. The Bible says no one is holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. Now every one of us this morning, I believe, as a child of God, knows that we are to praise God. I believe that we all know that we are to worship God. I think we understand that we are to exalt God. But now let me ask you this morning, do you understand the reason why we are to do those things? Listen to what the Bible says in Psalm 99 and verse 5. Exalt the Lord our God, worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Now notice the song of the seraphim that we read this morning. The word holy is repeated three times. There's a song in our hymn book. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, you know the song. Why is it repeated? In Hebrew poetry, repetition is a form of emphasis. If you want to emphasize something in English, there's several ways to do it. You might underline it. You might put it in italics. You might put it in bold face type. You might put an exclamation point at the end of the sentence. You might set the, the words off in quotation marks. All of those things are means by which we, in our modern day English language, emphasize a point. The Jewish people, the way they emphasize the point in their language is repetition. Repetition. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, to mention something three times in succession, it elevates it to the highest degree. It attaches to it the greatest importance. Understand this this morning. You will never know God as God is to be known until you see God as he really is. 
And you will never see God as he really is until you see him in his perfect holiness. Israel, uh, Isaiah here, he recognized God's purity. Look at the next point. Isaiah recognized God's purpose. The last part of verse 3 gives a word of testimony. The whole earth is full of his glory. If you want to know where this world is headed, I'll give you four words to explain it to you. The glory of God. That's where this world is headed. Do you know why you were born? Do you know why you are here? I think as a child of God, you and I have only one purpose in life, just one, and that is to glorify God. And anything else that I do, it's a waste of my time, it's a waste of my talents, it's a waste of my treasure. <laughs> Years ago, the Church of England put together what they call the Westminster Confession of Faith. And in that statement, they said, the child, or the chief, excuse me, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And I believe that's true. In the New Testament, we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31, the Bible says, therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. The motivating force behind everything you do is to bring glory to God. So that says to me this morning, anything that you can do for the glory of God, you ought to do. And anything you cannot do for the glory of God, you should never do. Ah, one more point here. Isaiah recognized God's presence. Look in verse 4. The posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. I've known some people who had a powerful voice in my life. I think the man with the strongest voice that I ever knew was my father. You could hear my father five miles off, I know. My mama had a rule at my house growing up. And the rule was, Paul, you get your chores done and you go outside and you go play. If you're underfoot in this house, I'll find something else for you to do. So my job was not to be underfoot in that house. I'd go down to the creek, I'd go down to the fish pond, I'd wander through the woods. I could hear my dad's voice five miles off. My dad would call it, supper time! <laughs> and I was coming home. I remember those days. The voice of God is an awesome voice. Isaiah heard it. And then the house of the Lord was filled with smoke. The smoke there represents the Shekinah glory of Almighty God. If I had time this morning, I could show you 30 verses in the Old Testament Scripture that shows and reveals that this is the Shekinah glory of Almighty God. So, the Bible here tells us, Isaiah was reminded rather forcefully that Uzziah might be gone, but the Lord was still there. And who do you depend on? Who do you need? You need the Lord. We need to remember this morning that if we are saved, we are never alone. And even during the down times of life, we still have the presence of the Lord with us. And the presence of the Lord with us, it makes all the difference. We need to see what Isaiah saw. Then I think we need to experience what Isaiah experienced. What do you see in verse 5? As a result of what Isaiah saw, listen to what happens next. So I said, this is Isaiah speaking, Woe is me, for I am undone. Now to understand what's going on there, let me say this to you. You need to go back and you need to read. Isaiah chapter 1 and Isaiah chapter 2 and Isaiah chapter 3 and Isaiah chapter 4 and Isaiah chapter 5. And if you will do that, you will find the prophet of God pronounced uh, judgments on the 
on the people of God. Whoa! And there were so many reasons that these judgments were pronounced. That's what prophets do. The prophet declares the message of the Lord God. Amen? Judgment is coming for, for Israel. God pronounced woe, but what happens to Isaiah when Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up? He says, woe is me. He says, for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When Isaiah saw the Lord in his holiness, what did Isaiah also see? He saw himself in his sinfulness. And then he saw the people in their wickedness. Now listen carefully to this next statement. I pray that you will get this down deep into your heart. If you don't hear anything else I say this morning, hear this. You will never see yourself for what you really are until you see the Lord God for who he really is. That's the lesson we learn from Isaiah. Do you know there's actually three people sitting in your seat this morning? Some of you looking around. Really, there are. There's three people in your seat this morning right there where you sit. There is the person you hope you are. There's the person that others think you are. And then there is the person that God knows you are. Isaiah, I think, was the leading prophet of his day. He would have been to the nation Israel what Billy Graham was to us for so many years. To his contemporaries, he was a man of unquestioned integrity. He would have been considered by far and away the most righteous man in all the land. Isaiah was looked up to. He was well respected by everyone who knew him. But when Isaiah got, uh, caught a glimpse of a holy God, and just one look is all it took, what happened? When he saw God, he saw himself. And it took seeing God for Isaiah to see his sinfulness and his guilt before God. And the result of that is, Isaiah cannot help but cry out aloud, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. True conviction always brings true confession. And what we see with Isaiah, Isaiah was convicted of his sin. When you come to the, to the Lord's house and the word of God is preached, and the spirit of God convicts your heart, don't get angry at the preacher. Get right with the Lord. Amen. God help us to do that. Isaiah did that. He was convicted of his sin. And true conviction always brings true confession. When a person refuses to admit his sin, when a person excuses his sin, it's because he has no true conviction. And there are so many people today who are trying to justify their sin. We live in a time where people call sins by other names. They won't call sin, sin. They call it a phobia. They won't call sin, sin. They call it a complex. They won't call sin, sin. They call it an illness. They won't call sin, sin. They call it a problem. There are so many people today trying to justify what they do and why they do it. You hear them, I hear them. Many people have told me, preacher, the problem that I have is my environment. It, it's what I grew up in. Or they'll say something like this. Preacher, I, I would have done better in life if I'd gotten uh, more education. That's my problem, lack of education. I've had people tell me, Preacher, the problem that I have in life, the reason I have so many issues is nobody paid attention to me growing up. Now, I understand that all of us live in homes that are less than perfect. I don't know of any perfect parent. I don't know any perfect mom and dad. I don't know any perfect children. Our homes certainly are less than perfect, but let me say this to you about all of that. You will never be freed from the bondage of sin until you first admit that you are a slave to sin. The only person 
who gets help is the person who admits that he needs help. Amen. Isaiah was convicted of his sin. And then notice verses 6 and 7. He was cleansed of his sin. And my time's just getting past me this morning. The seraphim flew to him. They took a live coal. They touched his mouth with it. A blazing white hot coal off of the altar. He touched the lips of the prophet. Now I imagine that was a painful thing. And as I read it, as I've studied this scripture, I, I have been surprised by it for years and years and years. Why did God touch Isaiah's lips? Um, Isaiah emphasized his lips in his testimony, his confession. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live in the midst of a people of unclean lips. So the, the seraph comes, the angel, and touches the lips. Why didn't he touch the heart? Let me point you to a verse in Matthew, chapter 12 and verse 34. Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. He says, brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's the reason. I heard an old country farmer put it like this one time. He said, what's down there in the well comes up in the bucket. <laughs> and when people speak filthy, unclean with the lips, it's because they have a dirty heart. Our lips need to be touched with a heavenly fire, just like Isaiah's lips were touched with a heavenly fire. We get the heart right, the lips will get we'll right. But I think most of us have basically two problems with our lips, or at least I have two problems with my lips. The first problem is sometimes I say things I should. Hello. Sometimes I do. I have learned not to give people a piece of my mind. My wife will tell you I do not have enough mind to be giving any of it away. <laughs> I just need to hold on to what I got. <laughs> sometimes we say things we shouldn't say, but even worse than that, sometimes we don't say the things that we should. If you're a child of God, if you've been saved by the grace of God, you've been saved to witness. God could have sent angels to preach the gospel, but he chose not to do that. He chose to send me, and he chose to send you. What happened with Isaiah when his lips were touched? He was never the same again. I think he became the prince of prophets. You read on in this book of Isaiah, he went on to say that God's word became like a fire in his bones. And he just had to declare it. But notice that this all began with cleansing. Cleansing only comes after conviction and confession. There's a scripture that I want to point to you this morning. And I look at this scripture every day because I need it every day. Every day, there's sinful thoughts that cross my mind. Every day, there's sinful attitudes in my heart. Every day, there's sinful things that I say and do. And what I do every day of my life is I get on my knees and I say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I shouldn't have thought that. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have felt that. I shouldn't have done that. Listen to 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to do what? And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm not worthy to preach. I'm not worthy to witness. I'm a sinner. I deserve God's judgment and God's wrath for my sin. But God loves me. Jesus died for me. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me from all sin. And it's because I have been cleansed that I can testify. I can preach. Isaiah, he was convicted of his sin. And then what else did he do? He was cleansed of his sin. 
Oh, what a blessed, blessed experience it is to be cleansed. And that comes through confession and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Let's close this morning. We, we need to say what Isaiah said. Look at verse 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And what's the answer? Then I said, Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. After the cleansing comes the calling. If you're sitting here this morning and God's spoken to your heart and you say, I want God to use me, get right. Get right. Confess every sin. Be cleansed. God will use you. Not only will God work in you, God will work through you. Always remember that. The cleansing comes before the calling. God does not demand a perfect vessel. He has none. But he does demand a clean vessel. If you want God to work in your life and through your life, get right. Confess your sins. Find forgiveness. Isaiah gives a testimony this morning in the verse we just read. His first part of his testimony, he testified that he was available. I like that. What did he say? He said, here am I. Isaiah did not hesitate. He did not equivocate. He didn't say, here am I, send him. <laughs> no. He didn't say, here am I, send the preacher. He didn't say, here am I, send anybody else but me. No, that's not what Isaiah said. Isaiah said, here am I, send me. Isaiah didn't answer God's question with a question. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we ask a question like this. If God asks, whom shall I send, who will go for us? You know what I sometimes say? Well, that all depends on where you want me to go, God. <laughs> maybe I will, maybe I won't. Any of you ever uh, questioned God that way? I have. Let me tell you how else I question God. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? I'll tell you another way I question. I say, well, God, that all depends on what you want me to do. We put conditions on our answer, don't we? That's not a willing heart. Isaiah, he signed a contract before it was ever drawn up. He was available. He was saying, God... Wherever you want me to go, I'll go. And whatever you want me to do, I'll do. Amen. We sing that song sometimes. God help us to live that song and testimony in our life. Isaiah, he, he testified that he was available. Then, then he also testified he was willing. Send me, he said. Isaiah was ready and willing to serve the Lord. I think he was saying to the Lord God, wherever you lead, I'll go. Whatever you ask, I'll do. Whatever you want, I'll give. Now, what is that? That's commitment. If a man or woman, if a young person, a child is committed to God, God works in and through them to be a blessing and for God's honor and God's glory. But we've got to be available and we've got to be willing. Somebody once said the world's greatest ability is availability. I've also heard dependability, and those are pretty close together. It's good to be available, but it's also good to be dependable. I remember I had a car a number of years ago. It was a plumber. Debbie, you remember that car? She wouldn't drive. It was a fine car. It was a nice car. It would get you anywhere you wanted to go. It just wouldn't get you back home. <laughs> I broke down in every town in Franklin County. And every town in Hart County. Every town in uh, Madison County. I had Roger Kennedy's phone number on speed dial. Roger, boy, he picked me up more than once. He'd work on that car, he'd get it running, and it'd run fine. He'd get me to where I needed to go, just wouldn't get me back home. And he, he told me one day, he says, Preacher, you got the devil in that car. And I'm going to tell you what I did. I got rid of it. There's some things you just can't fix. Funny thing about it was, uh, I got a letter a few years after that from the Plymouth people. They asked me if, 
if I would ever buy another plymouth that I had the opportunity to sit down and write with them, you know, uh, a very nice letter in return. No, I will not buy a Plymouth. I will not take a Plymouth if you give it to me. Uh, availability is important. Dependability is important. All right? Lord, forgive me. I shouldn't have said all that. I, I was preaching and I went to meddling. Uh, God can do anything with anyone at any time. In any place, if they will just say, Lord, here am I, send me. Amen. Isaiah testified he was willing. When a man sees God, I think when he really sees God, he wants to share God. He wants to go and tell. I'm going to tell you the first thing that happened in my life when God really touched me is I wanted to tell everybody else about it. All right. Genuine worship always leads to bold witnessing. If God's done, done a work in your life, if God is doing a work in your life, you're going to want to share that with others. Isaiah, the prophet, he was disturbed by the death of King Uzziah. Because not only was King Uzziah his king, he was his cousin. And you go back and you read and you study, and the Bible tells us that Isaiah served as a scribe to the king. What did the scribe do? He kept the king's accounts. He kept the king's records. He knew everything the king said, everything the king did. Uzziah and Isaiah were close. Uzziah died. He had reigned for 52 years. It brought to the nation the end of a time of great prosperity and stability. And for Isaiah and the entire nation, it ushered in a time of uncertainty, change, and doubt. We do not like change. Do we like change? No. We do not like change. None of us like change, except for my wife. She likes change. Every day I come home, something's moved, and she'll ask me, what is it tonight? And it's been that way 41 years, hasn't it? If I came home and the wall was gone, I'd notice that. If I came home and the house didn't have a roof, I'd notice that. If I came home and there wasn't windows and doors, I'd notice that. But I don't notice the little things. God help me. You don't want me to do interior decorating. <laughs> and, and you don't want me to do landscaping. If it's green, boy, I'm going to cut it down. <laughs> Daddy's always planting stuff. I can't tell the difference sometimes between the flowers and the weeds, Cap. <laughs> Amen or old me. It's, it's old me. We don't like change. Uh, but change is inevitable in life, isn't it? What was change like for Isaiah? What happened to him? It was a time of rediscovery. I think what had happened to Isaiah, his, his, his attention had been focused on Uzziah. And now that Uzziah is dead, he has refocused his attention back to the Lord. Isaiah had a fresh encounter with God. This is one artist rendering of what it might have been like when Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. You see the seraphim? Oh, what an awesome thing it is to have a fresh encounter with God. A change is, is coming to my life. A change is coming uh, for this church. God is moving me off the scene. And God is going to bring a new preacher. But what I want you to hear from my heart this morning is it, it doesn't matter. It, it's not about me. When you come to the Lord's house, you don't come to see me. You come to see the Lord. And as God brings a new preacher to this church, I'm excited to see what God's going to do. We need a fresh encounter with God. We need that. Sometimes change is good. 
if it refocuses our minds and our hearts on the Lord. That's the key, right? We need to see the Lord high and lifted up. As a close this morning, I want to ask you today, do, do you think, have you seen uh, what Isaiah saw? Have you experienced what Isaiah experienced? Have you, have you been willing to say what Isaiah said? Lord, here am I send me. If you will be willing and available, God will work in you and God will work through you. I thank God for you. You're a blessing to me. I'm excited to see what God is going to do through you. Our musician's going to come. We're going to close our service with a hymn of invitation. Every head bowed, every eye closed just for a moment. I've done the best I could do this morning to share with you the message that God gave to me. I'm just the messenger. It's not about me, it's about the Lord. And, and my question is, is there someone today that just as God convicted Isaiah, God has convicted you. And you know that there's some things you need to get right in your personal life, in your work life, in your home life. If God's spoken to your heart and there's some things you need to, to make right, take advantage of this opportunity. Remember what 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's let the Lord have his will and way. Almighty God, in this moment of invitation, we humbly bow before you, Lord. And we pray that we will see you, the Lord our God, high and lifted up. Have your will and way, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Stand with us as we sing together. Our ushers are gone, our, uh, our musicians are going to lead us in an invitation hymn.